If you have your Bibles, we have graduated to Romans 2. And I don't think that word graduation lately because Romans 1 needs a graduation. And the fact that you're here this morning tells me you, you might be for real. You know, you made it through Romans 1. Now, Romans 2, my friends, it's no cakewalk. So brace yourselves because here's what Paul does. You have to understand what Paul is doing here. Remember, I want to I paint the picture again to you that that this is a church in a city of Rome, and this church is comprised of Gentiles and Jews. Everyone who's not a Jew is a Gentile, right? And they're coming from this very pagan background, worldly background, lustful background. Everything that Paul talks about in Romans 1 is addressing the fact that Gentiles are coming into the house of God, and now they need to live as holy people, right? So if you are a Jew... You probably loved Romans 1. You got to read between the lines here. Like, the Jews are probably going, yeah, Paul, get them. Show them how sinful they are. Show them how wicked they are for not following the laws of God. That's how religious people talk. Paul's like, hold on, because now I need to address you, Jewish religious people. So I want to title this talk, Jesus wants to save religious people. And the fact that there's no way man in this house, I have the right group of people to speak to this morning, that Jesus actually has a lot to say about those who have a religious background but don't necessarily have the gospel. So this is where we're going today. Paul was like, man, I addressed the Gentiles, the pagan world, the craziness out there, but now let me address the craziness within because Jesus also wants to save church people. And we in church. So I'm not talking about anybody outside of these walls right now. I'm talking to us in this building. Can you say amen? amen. Romans chapter 2 begins this way. He says, you may think you can condemn such people. But you are just us. Oh, say it like you're here. You're just us. Because I'm bad. I'm bad. You know it. You know it. In the world of has to... I never know what Michael Jackson's saying. Who's bad? He's like the first mumble rapper. Jamon. Come on. Jamon. You are just as bad. And you have. No come on, say it like you're here. You have. No oof. When you say they, they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning. No. For you judge others. For, for you who judge others, do this. Oh. Not me. And we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin. But because you are. And refuse to turn from your sin. You are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for, who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil. For the church folk first. And also for the wild people coming in. 
But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good for the church first and also for the and watch this for God does not show you thought you were God's favorite you thought you were all that a bag of chips with the dip because you never miss church stay tuned Verse 12, when the Gentiles sin, they will be destroyed even though they never had God's written law. And the Jews who do have God's law will be judged by their law when they fail to obey it. For merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. It is obeying the law that makes us right in his sight. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it even without having heard it, that GPS system. They demonstrate that God's law is written in there for their own. And, and, and what? Either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. Remember? Wrong, wrong, bypass. And this is the message I proclaim the day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's... Oh. Secret life. And that is the word of the Lord. Can you say amen? Amen. Jesus wants to save religious people. Tension in this church is between these two cultures. So tense that Paul is writing to try to bridge the gap between them two to say, you're both missing it. You need the grace of Jesus Christ is what will unite you. There's no such thing as picking sides because God shows no favoritism. God don't like you any better than he liked the person who's sitting outside the church right now. So the Jewish believers love Romans 1 because Paul brought the hammer on the Gentiles. And they were probably, let me rephrase that. If last week felt really good to you, Welcome to this week. That's what Paul is doing here. It's like, I got to address both sides. We got to deal with this because neither of you understand the actual gospel. So he turns his attention to the Jewish believers, to the, to the ones who have the law, the ones who, who seem to have it pretty good. And Paul, the point he's making is this, that the gospel is for the irreligious and for the religious. There is a third option. It's called the gospel. It's not the world, it's not religion, it's the gospel. And that's what Paul is doing here. Because in a way, if you're taking notes, religion is another perspective of idolatry. Our battle is idolatry. We take good things and we turn them into God things. The problem is the religious idolaters are way more subtle This is where it's going to get fun. You see, religious people are professional sinners. Someone in the world doesn't know any better. They'll just just act a fool and they'll show you their true colors. Religious people are way more disciplined in their sinning. They know how to hide well. They know how to put on the facade. They know the lingo. They know how to impress people, but God's not impressed. The reason why God's not impressed is that God bypasses all of the outward appearances. God's like, but I see your heart. I see your true colors. I see your true colors. God's like, man, you can put on a front all you want. I know you. The real you. See, religious people know how to hide what I like to call behind Christianese. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Bless you, Pastor. But in your heart, 
I'll backstab you in a minute, pastor. The moment you say something I don't like, I will backstab you smiling. <laughs> Too glad you're in church this morning. See, here's the thing with religion. No one, and take this to the bank, no one lives up to their own standards. Everybody falls short, even of their own standards. Everybody wants to create their own standards for what looks good, for what is good, for what is holy, for what is righteous, for what is sinful. The thing is, you end up with charts about what's really sinful and what's not so sinful. It depends on if you do them or not. If others do it, hey! But if you do it, well, the way my righteousness is set up. Problem is, God doesn't have different charts and graphs. God says, the playing field is the same for me. And I'm not impressed by any of that. Matter of fact, God's like, I don't even look at that stuff. A great example of this is when, when God told prophet Samuel, hey, I want you to go anoint my new king. Because here's the thing, because they anointed one based on their own credentials and preferences, and he didn't have my heart. They anointed Saul. Saul is a picture of religion. When we're in charge, we're like, we want Saul. Why? Because he looks good. He's tall. He's handsome. He looks nice. He must be nice. And Paul, Saul jacks up the whole country because he never had God's heart. God's like, this time, let me pick. Go get me a man after my own heart. Samuel goes to where God sent him. And this dude lines up his brothers, his sons in the room, and he's like, look at these guys, man. There, look at them. They look good, right? Pick. Picks him. Get your pick. Oh. Samuel goes one by one, and he's like, nope, 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 nope. And he's like, wait, there's got to be. Is this it? Because God's not co-signing any of this. The father said, yeah, there's one more, but you know, he's, he's just a shepherd boy. He's not even, I can't even have him in the room. He's not qualified. To be in the room. He's out tending sheep. Samuel says, bring him in. They bring in the young one, the wild one, David. And he says, that's the one. Why is he the one? Because God had already given him the criteria for picking David. Look what God says to prophet Samuel. He says this to prophet Samuel. Look, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his. God's like, I don't care what he looks like. He says, you guys do that. I don't. I don't look at his appearance or his height like, oh, look, he's 6'4". He must be handsome and great. <laughs> That's actually better than I think you guys got it. For I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. In other words, you have limited understanding. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know what the word heart is? The real you. The word heart, mind, soul, they're all connected. It's saying like the real you. The one that doesn't put on the front because it's Sunday morning. The real you. So I'm looking for the real you. Not the religious version of you. Not the Sunday morning version of you. Not the people are around impress me in you. The you that no one sees when no one's watching you. The real you is what I'm looking for. He gave David the greatest compliment you will find in the entire Bible. He said, David, that's a man after my own heart. You won't find a better compliment coming from God the Father. Saying, I like him, man. He's got my heart. See, the thing is, 
we have limited understanding. Therefore, we pass judgment on others based on our own perception of what goodness is. In other words, to pass judgment is to believe that others deserve God's wrath and you don't. Based on your own version of the merits that you created for yourself. And it's so much easier to see what others are doing than to put a spotlight on my soul. So much easier to bash others. But to not look at the finger that comes back this way. We criticize, listen, we criticize others harshly and give ourselves a pass. I can't believe he did that. Well, what'd you do last night? See, we, please write this down. Self-righteousness is the enemy of the gospel. The reason why self-righteousness is the enemy of the gospel is because, because you don't earn or deserve righteousness. It's a gift. It's a grace-given thing. It's imputed on you. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You can never work for it. So in other words, self-righteousness is what actually keeps you from the grace of God. Tim Keller says it this way. He says, a self-righteous person will acknowledge the existence of God, but sees no need for him. How many people have you heard say, I believe in God, but then you look at their lives, you're like, where's the evidence of that belief, of that dependency, of that desire, the longing to know him? Or do you just go to him on a rainy day like he's a vending machine? Boop, 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 boop. Ah, God. No relationship. Jesus has a lot to say about this. If you, if you want to see how Jesus has a problem with religion, you go read the Gospels. Jesus came face to face with religious people all the time. The people that gave him the hardest time on earth were religious. Nothing new under the sun. We haven't changed. In his greatest sermon ever given, Sermon on the Mount, the, the context that Jesus brings the sermon is to a religious group of people. And he, and he destroys their worldview because for them, it was everything about doing things outwardly. Jesus talks about the heart, the posture of the heart. And he gets to the end of his sermon in Matthew 7, it's a long sermon, man. From, you want to hear Jesus' heart, go read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Read that all the time. Let it permeate your soul. Because this is the heart of what it means to follow Jesus. He gets to Matthew 7, and he puts it this way. Jesus is he's sarcastic at times. But if you're religious, you won't find him funny. Watch this. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be the measure to you. You know what he's saying? I'll judge you by your own standards. In other words, if you get to judgment seat without the grace of God, all Jesus will do is, hey, I'm going to run the back to tape that you created for yourself. And tell me if you live up to that standard. In other words, as K. Verdians, we have a saying that, Peshitamari Pasiprapi Baka. Which means the fish die by his own mouth. No one make the fish bite. The fish bites because he wants to. So the fish cannot say, oh, the bait got me. No, no, you got yourself. Oh, that's a word. Watch this. Here's where he gets sarcastic. Jesus is funny. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Now, that's hilarious. Unless he's talking to you, you won't find that funny. But, like, get that picture, sawdust. If, you ever, if I had sawdust up here, you wouldn't see it. It would be so small that you wouldn't see it. But if I had a plank up here, like, basically, if I had a log up here in my eye, you would see it. You see the, the, the contrast here? Jesus like, you got this log sticking out of your eye, and you're worried about the speck in that person's eye. 
What's wrong with you? Because it feels better to look at someone's speck than to confront my log. <laughs> I wish I had a log up here. I can see it in the spirit. <laughs> Put it this way. You ever watch Pinocchio? Imagine your nose is this far out and you're trying to hit someone's sawdust. You're just going to hit them with your own. Oh, y'all. Keep going. Look, he says, he says, how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, you sinner. <laughs> when all the time there is a plank in your own eye, you, Jesus said it, I didn't. Just reading the Bible. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. Did you catch that? Religion makes you see distorted. You need to see clearly, because when you see clearly, you have no room and no leg to stand on to judge anybody else. See, here's, here's what happens. We are judged by our own measurements. All God has to do is play the tape back. That's all he does. I don't know if you guys have been watching these commercials, progressive commercials, they like throw a flag, yep. run it back. That's what God will do. He's like, just run it back. You're like, I didn't do it. Like, oh. How about I run back your thoughts? Let me run back your thoughts from like just 10 minutes ago. Some of y'all, let me run back the text from worship this morning. I will make room for you. <laughs> Says you're singing, but your heart's far from me. Let me run back the tape. No one can stand this. See, the thing with a religious spirit, please get this because it's so important. A religious spirit creates a critical spirit. A critical spirit, man, is it's tough to live with. Better yet, it's tough to be around it. If you're married to a critical person, it doesn't matter how many times you do something, they will always find the flaw. You're married to a critical person, man, you could do A to Z, and then she'd be like, the way you took the garbage out today. It's a like, shut up and appreciate the fact that I took the garbage out. <laughs> Don't elbow anybody. Critical spirit is scary. God revealed this to me that I could parent from a critical spirit standpoint. Man, it jacked me up when God shed the spotlight and says, you're being too critical of your son. You're thinking he's you. Critical spirit, parents will make kids run away from you. Critical spirit makes you want to control people instead of lead people. Critical spirit, man, will make you say and do stuff, even in friendships, man. There are some friends that you're like, man, they're always critical. I don't know if you ever felt this way, man. There's sometimes you are with a group of people and you walk away feeling terrible. You're like, why is it that every time I'm around the same people, I walk away feeling terrible? There's got to be a critical spirit there. Hey, you got a promotion, they didn't celebrate you, check your circle. Like all of a sudden, you used to go out with your girlfriends every weekend, but now you got a man of God, you're working on it, and you're trying to get better, and now they're criticizing you for having a man of God because you're not, you're not miserable like they are. Man, critical spirit, man, you see it in church. People are very critical, man. You can, you can do a lot of good things, but the moment you do one thing, man, then, ah! It's like you've been here, I've been here nine years. You never said once to me, great job, pastor. 
but you're quick on the trigger to criticize. Now, you go to a restaurant, you don't like it, you get out, you get on your militant Facebook page. <laughs> Question I want to ask you is, have you ever ran a restaurant? Have you ever taken a loan and, and gave your blood, sweat, and tears to create a place for people to come and, and find hope and find community? But maybe you caught them on a bad day and you decided to ruin something that they've been working so hard for. All right. But you know everything. I don't know if you've seen this. Now there's reviews for churches. Right. Have you seen them? Amazing. <laughs> Amazing church status. That church is the worst. To which I is what I want to propose. How about we have one for pastors to review their parishioners? How about we get it on it too? Because I want to say some stuff too. Hey, Bob, Bob's been here six months. He never tied once. Man, Bob in worship, he looks like his grandmother died every single week. Bob never served anyone, never helped anyone. Bob has been to three churches in three weeks. Son is wrong. Oh, we don't like it when we go the other way. Bob says he's only available to serve every six months. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Let's have a review for parishioners. Bob has been there for two years. Never joined the mission. Critical spirit, man. So, of course, if you're, if you're a critic, what do you say to that? You say, well, what about when there's something wrong? Am I supposed to not say anything? Here's what you're supposed to do. Don't be a critic. Be a coach. Yeah. Be a coach. We need more coaches. You know why we need more coaches? Because coaches know when you did something wrong. But they don't criticize you for it. They put their arms around you. They grab the tablet and say, let's go over the play again. Let's make sure we get this right. Because I care about you. I want you to succeed. I want you to be blessed. I'm not here to bless you. I'm here to bless you. If you really care about someone, you don't criticize them publicly, you do it privately. When you criticize publicly, it's your self-righteousness to prove to everybody that you're right and everybody's wrong. Not realizing, wow, you live by self-righteousness. You never had a bad day in your life. You've never said anything wrong in your life. You never thought anything wrong in your life. Go read the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is saying, listen, some of y'all, you're like, I never kill anyone. He's like, but you kill them in your mind. I've never lost it. Ah, oh, you've actually had four adulteries in your mind. So think twice before you become a critic. How about you become a coach? How about you pull someone aside and say, hey, let's walk through this. Let's see how you can get better at this. Because I care about you. I don't care about being right. We need more coaches in this world, man. Got enough critics. I don't know about you. I better taste food than talk about it. See, the thing with, with this is so important, man. I hope you catch this because you, you, if you're saying for real I make room, you need to pay attention to this. See, the problem is religious people want to take the place of the Holy Spirit. Our problem, I'm preaching to myself. Our problem is that we want to do more than God called us to do. We want to impose ourselves on others. Not be a guide to others. So in other words, I want to make sure that you know that I played a role in your walk. So I need to tighten you up, tell you what to say, tell you what not to say, what to wear, what not to wear, what is the right worship service, what is the right Bible to read, what is all that. So at the end of the day I can say, look, look, I helped you. Look at me. And then we do this. The great thing that drives me nuts about church is false humility. 
we have a hard time just saying thank you. You ever talk to a loser person? They can't just say thank you. It's, I mean, I mean uh, glory to God. I mean, hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Ha, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. It's like, can you just say thank you? Because if you knew it wasn't about you, you would just say thank you. But you make, it, you make it weird when you make it clearly that you want the attention. And God forbid you did something, I didn't mention your name. Because we want credit. We want credit. You know, I led that person to the Lord. Yeah, you and a hundred other people. <laughs> but you got to close the deal. Now you're thinking you're the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's like, I did all the work. I just gave you a chance to close the deal to make you like, feel like you're part of this. <laughs> yeah, are they ready? <laughs> Here's how I see it, man. We want credit too much. See, you know the old, like, bad angel, good angel thing? I, I, I see it this way. There's a religious angel. It's like, look at you. They should listen to you more, you know? If everyone was like you. <laughs> I'm preaching to myself! We want credit. But the thing is, he says, he says, righteousness is credited unto you. Like you don't earn credit. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. It was, it was put on you, this righteousness of God. It's so crazy that if you're thinking straight, you realize you have nothing to boast about. If you're thinking clearly, if the log is out, you go, oh my God, it's been him all along. He's been guiding me. He's been leading me. He's been protecting me. He's been blessing me. He's been, he's been making sure I'm in the right track. Like, I got nothing to boast but the cross of Jesus Christ. But you know what's the biggest boastfuls in the world? Religious people. I've been in the church for like 35 years, even though I'm only 20. <laughs> You know, it's amazing. Jesus illustrates this point in a, his greatest story ever that everybody knows. And missed, most people miss the point. It's a universal story. If I say prodigal son, we all go, oh. But we miss the point of why he told that story in the first place. He actually told that story to illustrate the point that Paul is making here. If you go back, go home and reread Luke 15, right? How does it start? It starts by telling you this. It says, it says, sinners, notorious sinners, tax collectors would come to hear Jesus speak. And this made the religious people angry and indignant. So Jesus says, let me tell you all a story. In other words, Romans 1 and Romans 2 got together. Jesus is like, let me tell you a story. A man had Two sons. He never said a man had a prodigal son. We made that up later. A man had two sons. The younger, who represents Romans 1, goes to the father that represents God and says, give me my inheritance right now. I want to live my life the way I want to live it. Which basically, he said to the father, I wish you were dead. Because to get your inheritance, your father has to be dead. He disrespected the father. Jesus was making the point. Some people live like they are their own God. They disrespect God. They take what they want and live the way they want to. And the Bible says this younger brother went out into the world and slept with prostitutes, had wild parties, did whatever he wanted to do, squander everything that the father gave him, which is a picture of living outside of God's will as Gentiles. He gets to a place where he hits rock bottom. And sometimes God will let you hit rock bottom to realize he's the rock at the bottom all along. He hits rock bottom. He says he has a revelation because only a revelation from God will show you how jacked up you are. And he says, what am I doing here? In my father's house, I had everything and I've squandered everything here. I'm going to run home and repent for how I have lived. And as he's 
running home, the father meets him, greets him, welcomes him home. He says, my, my son is home. We need to throw a party. We need to celebrate this moment because it's not about how good you are. It's about taking dead people and making them come alive. That's the gospel. And that would be a Hollywood ending right there. But no, he says, yes, two sons. As they throw in a party. Here's how the other son responds. The son that represents religion. Go ahead and put it up. Luke 15. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields. Doing what? Working. When he returned home... He heard music and dancing. Nothing makes religious people more angry than to see people in church singing and dancing. (laughs) You want to start a religious war? Start dancing. (laughs) In the Old Testament, David, man after God's own heart, was dancing his heart out because the ark of God was back. Bible says he was just going in. I don't know what kind of dancing we're doing back then, but David was doing it. He was going in. And you know what the Bible says? That, that the wife was sitting up in the castle watching him dance. And, and, and in, it, in her heart said, what is this fool doing? And you know what the Bible says? David never entered her again. She became barren. Why? Because religion is barren. Religion has no fun. If you're having fun, you're sinning. Watch this. He asked one of the servants, what was going on? Your, your brother's back, he was told. And your father has killed a fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. In two weeks, we'll have Celebration Sunday. It says a lot about your heart if you don't celebrate long. It means you've graduated to something other than the gospel. When you don't celebrate people going public with their faith saying, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was dead, but now I'm alive. Watch this, it gets worse. Keep going. The older brother was? There's nothing that says spirit of religion more than anger. You want to see angry people? Go to church. And wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you. Look at the language he uses. He's a son. He's a son. Pay attention to how religious people talk about serving God. Is it a joy or is it an obligation? All these years I've gone to church and I served. And never once refused to do a single thing you told me. In other words, he obeyed, but not from a a place of love. He He obeyed out of obligation. This is so important. And in all that time, you never gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. To which, if you're reading between the lines, you got to ask the question. Did you ever ask the father for a goat to celebrate with your friends? Because I'm pretty sure this father would have graciously give you a goat to celebrate with your friends. Religion assumes a lot. We assume... Instead of asking. Keep going. Yet this son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours. Comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes. You celebrate by killing the fattened calf. How dare you celebrate this crackhead. How dare you celebrate this homeless dude. How dare you celebrate this guy who's been to jail? His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. That's what I'm saying. Just ask. Just ask. It's all yours. You're missing the point. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, 
but now he's found. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't miss this. This is Roman 1 and Roman 2 collided into 1. This is about two sons being both lost. One lost in the world. One lost in the house. You know the saying, not all who wander are lost. Some are lost in the house. Never step foot in a club, but don't have the love of Jesus. Did church, but don't have relationship. Sad. But that's the reality of a lot of people. Why do you think a lot of kids who come from religious homes can't wait to leave? Because they grew up in a strict home, but they didn't grow up in a grace home. This dude had enough sense to know, man, my house is full of grace. I need to go home. Do you understand why we work so hard to try to make this house a house of grace? Because we all need it. We all need the grace of God. The word prodigal, by the way, means wasteful. Some learn that way. Wasteful. He wasted it in sex. Wasted it in wild living, prostitution, materialism, disobedient. The older brother wasted it in Obedience, compliance without the grace. Both lost in need of God to be their savior. Do you celebrate when prodigals come home? Because that says a lot about your heart. See, please write this down. Religious obedience looks godly, but it's an idolatry. It's obedience for my own convenience. Just so I can... Put credit to my self-righteousness. This is going to jack you up. You might have to sit with this one because this backs me up. Morality is the self-worth of religious people. How do some religious people feel good about themselves? They have to compare themselves to others who do worse than they do. That's why some people love social media. It's a, it's a place to go and say everything I can say because I need to feel better for myself. And I hope you co-sign me. It's an idolatry. It's a dopamine idolatry. But it's an idolatry all the same. Looking for validations in the wrong places. See, they're hoping that their goodness will save them. But Paul was saying, oh, actually, your goodness is storing up more wrath. See, this is going to jack you up. You got to sit with this one. Morality is the self-worth of religious people. Not God. The way that, you, that religious people measure their self-worth is by how moral they are. They're not looking at God. They're looking at morality. That's why some will celebrate last week. and like, yeah, you tell them, you tell them, you tell them. I didn't do any of those things. But you can still miss the heart of God. Because the gospel is not bad. It's not, gospel is not like, hey, you're really bad, you become good. No, you're really dead, you come alive. That's the gospel. And what Paul is doing, I got to run here. What Paul is doing is, Paul, remember, everything hinges on Romans 1, 16 and 17. Everything that he's saying, he's trying to unite these two groups of people under the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to show them like, hey, don't hinge your hope, your morality on anything other than Jesus. So let me bring us back to Romans 1.16, because this is the hinge, this is the heart of this entire book, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1.16, anyone in the back, throw it up. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to, to who? Everyone. Jews, Gentiles, crackheads, millionaires, homeless, middle class, black, white, Latino, Spanish. Really moral people, really shady people. 
everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentiles. For in the gospel, watch this, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith, not by your works, not by your morality, not by how good you've been, not by how much you gave in the offering today. Righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith, not morality. But because of the righteousness of God, it empowers you to live a moral life. Not the other way around. Your morality doesn't earn you anything. If anything, he says, your morality stores up more wrath for you. Did you catch that? Because he's like, hey, if, you, if you're going to bank your whole life on your morality, just remember that he's going to play the tape back for you. And I don't know about you. You in God's court, your lawyer will need a lawyer. <laughs> Problem is we want to sit on the judgment seat. Man, the world right now loves the judgment seat. The world loves to judge. We don't like what you said. You're canceled. That's judgment. We have our own verdict now. If I don't like something, I'm canceling you. I'll block you. <laughs> then I'll talk about you. I'll tell everybody to hate you. We've created our own judgment seat. And it's always going to be imperfect because who are you to judge anyone? When you yourself can't even measure up to your own standards. You already broke so your standards today. Just in your mind, you already broke them. Jesus goes as far as saying, hey, you, just your thought of you thinking about someone in the wrong way, you already broke the law. You're like, I didn't kill anybody. Yeah, you killed them in your mind, though. I didn't have sex with anyone. You did in your heart. Do you understand what he's getting at? We're all guilty. There's a lot of things we don't say out loud, but, man, we say them. Jesus said one day, the stuff you think in a secret will be exposed in the light. <laughs> Do you want all your thoughts exposed in the light? So I'll leave you with a test today, friends. I'm preaching to myself. I hope you know this. Here's a test of your self-righteousness. You got to be honest with yourself. Religious people have a hard time being honest with themselves. We hide behind religious masks. Yeah. You ever talk to a religious person where you just want an, like a straight answer, you can't get one? So how are you doing? Well, this is the thing, right? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> it's like, can you just tell me you're hurting? But God's good, though. Yeah, he's good, but you're hurting right now. Can we be honest? Yes. Three questions to consider today as we take communion. Because communion levels the playing field. Jesus says everybody's welcome to the table. Watch this. Now, question number one to think about today, to consider. You might have to sit with this. Do you see yourself as a hopeless sinner in need of grace? Because Remember, if you can't understand how of a sinner you are, you won't appreciate the grace of God. If you think you arrived because you're such a good person, you have no idea how far you are from the grace of God. True. You know what are the hardest people to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Religious people. Yeah. Who gave Jesus the hardest time on earth? Let me give you another homework. You want to see Jesus while out? Go read Matthew 23. You were like, this is the same Jesus we worship? Yep. Yeah. Called them brood of vipers. Called them empty tombs. You said, man, you, you wash the outside of the cup, but the inside you're dirty. Yeah. I read that, man. It jacks me up. I'm like, dear Jesus, have mercy. Here's question number two. You got to sit with the stuff. You know, sometimes it's easier to do a religious thing than to actually sit with yourself. Let me tell you something. You could do a lot of religious things all week long and never connect with God. 
Some religious people don't want to face themselves. You know what they do? They'll mask themselves with a lot of religious things. They'll read the Bible, they'll pray, they'll listen to podcasts, but God never got to their heart. Do you judge those outside of church or do you think my heart is by nature just like theirs? Any hint of better than another person, you don't have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Any hint. Well, I'm not as bad as you already lost the gospel with that mindset. Anytime there's a me versus them mindset, that's not the gospel. Some people think they're more superior because the side that they pick. And God doesn't pick side because remember, he shows no what? Favoritism. Last question. Do you think you can stand before God on your own merits, meaning on your own works? Or that your values fall short without God's righteousness. Because you'll play the tape back for you. That blows my mind. Jesus is like, I won't judge you based on somebody else. I'll judge you based on your own standards. And show you that you fall short. You ever done something you said you'll never do? You ever said something you said you'll never say? We all have, we all guilty. That's the point he's making. Hey, don't think because Romans 1 doesn't apply to you that you, you're good. No, you have a different type of situation going on. See, if you grew up in a church, you have a different type of situation than someone who's coming into the church. That's why sometimes someone brand new will get it quicker than someone who's been here. Because they realize, whoa, I'm jacked up. And the person who's here is like, yeah, you are. Let me help you. It always cracks me up when the religious person is like, I'm the one that led that person to the Lord. Yeah, you, you did? Wow, I didn't know you were the Holy Spirit. You and a hundred of the people that God used along the way to bring this person here. But guess what? You're, the, you're amazing. We should worship you. Religious people will say funny things, man. You will never find a prodigal say, I didn't like service today. I didn't like the songs we sang. Only religious people talk like that. Because the prodigal is just excited to be in the house. <laughs> Only all the brothers will have certain criteria. Because they're bored with their own righteousness. We need the gospel. We need salvation. We need Jesus. When you come to the table of Jesus, you don't come because you deserve it. You don't come because you earned it. No one has special parking spots here. You're sitting on my seat. Oh, I didn't know you had a seat. We all come as sinners saved by the grace of God. We all come in need of salvation. We all come in need of grace. Crazy that your own righteousness can keep you from God. Your own idea of morality can keep you from God. That's why the younger brother ran home. Because he realized, wow, I jacked this up. The older brother is home. The other day someone asked me, how come we don't have revival like it's happening in Kentucky? I'm like, are you kidding me? Have you looked around lately? Have you seen how many people God has rescued here? You have seen how many people God is restoring and healing? How can we add a third service if God's not moving here? Are you out of your mind? You gotta be out of your mind. No, it's your own version that you want. You want something to say, oh, look, look what we did. You can't conjure up revival. You're not the Holy Spirit. You gotta be in tune with the Holy Spirit to see what he's doing. 
The gospel is come and die, man. Come and die to yourself. Come and die to your flesh. Come and die to your own understanding. Come and die to your own version of Christianity. Come and die to your religion. Come and die to your tradition. Die to the thing that's killing you. Because religion kills more people than the world does.